This is Pawn Zero to Hero. It's the fourth episode of the series and today we are going to take a look at GDB or the GNU debugger. This debugger was initially released in 1986 to debug compiled programs, but today it has become one of the most used tools in binary exploitation. In the last episode, we looked at Ghidra and how it gave us a nice way to statically look at a binary, its assembly and some decompiled C code. But sometimes you want to know what's going on whilst running the binary. What statements are causing those pesky errors? Why is your exploit not working? All these questions can be answered by dynamically reversing your binary with, for example, GDB. We're building onto the knowledge that we have acquired throughout the rest of this series, so be sure to check out the full playlist to get up to speed. Links can be found in the description down below. In the last video, I also stated that if it got a thousand views, that I would release the next episode and you guys absolutely smashed that amount, so a huge thanks for that. I'm going to repeat that offer for this video. If it gets a thousand views, then I can guarantee you that there will be another episode. But with all that out of the way, let's talk about what we will be learning today. First of all, we're going to chat a bit about what GDB is, when we're going to use it, and what flavor or variant we're going to use in this series. Spoiler alert, it's Pwn Debug. We're then going to use GDB to solve the crack me from last week without having to do any calculations or without having to understand any of the code. And after that, we're going to cover some of the most used GDB commands that you will want to remember. I will also link to some cheat sheets that you might want to print out and hang above your wall. But without further ado, let's get into this. GDB or the GNU debugger is a tool that allows us to see what's going on on the inside of a program. You can do things such as stepping through the program assembly instruction by assembly instruction. You can analyze a stack or registers at any given point during the execution of the program. You can see where your errors occur and much, much more. But GDB is old. It's very old. It was in fact created in 1986 and it wasn't specifically made to do binary exploitation. It is just a debugger. This is why most people performing advanced binary exploitation will choose a variant or wrapper such as PETA, Jeff or Pwn Debug. These tools extend the capabilities of GDB by automating certain tasks, providing easy ways to use shortcuts and make things a bit more visually appealing. In this video series, we are going to be using Pwn Debug or Pwn DBG, which is an open source variant that's still well maintained to this day. But if you choose to use Jeff as your wrapper for GDB, then do not fear because most of what we will cover will also work there. But a question that may come up is why use GDB when there's other tools with a GUI available, such as IDA. Those tools are also really amazing, but what I like about GDB is how easy it is to tie it into other workflows. We won't see that in today's video, but in the next one we will, for example, be setting up pwn tools to write complex exploits and to automatically open up GDB for us to work in, which is a very powerful thing to do. And GDB allows us to do that, but for now let's just install GDB and pwn debug. Installing GDB can on most distributions be done using apt install GDB, and with that in place we can put pwn debug on top of it, and to install Pwn Debug, you can just clone the repository, cd into it, and run the setup.sh script. And once that has completed, Pwn Debug should be installed, and if you now try to run GDB, you should see that your prompt says Pwn Debug. With that, our environment is complete. Now let's move on by solving the crack me from last week without actually understanding the code. The binary that we're going to look at is the same one we assessed in the last video. To quickly recap, if we run it, it asks us for a username, a number, and then a password, and we obviously want to find the correct password. Last time, however, we reversed the assembly code and we made assumptions as to what this binary could be doing. This time, we can just run it and see what it is doing. 
internally step by step. So let's open it up in GDB by running GDB please crack me. Of course, GDB also has ways of statically assessing the binary. For example, let's start by using the info command to display all the functions it finds in the binary. We can do this using info functions. This gives us a list where we can spot the main function. If I now want to see the assembly code of the main function, we can run disassemble main or the shorthand disass main, and this will show us the disassembly, which, well, looks pretty difficult to understand. In Pwn Debug, you can even get the Ghidra decompiled code using the Ghidra command. But well, that isn't really straightforward to understand either. A small note, if that Ghidra command isn't working for you, it's because it requires some other Radari 2 things to be installed. Do not worry though, I would highly recommend to just use the actual Ghidra tool for assessing the decompilation of a binary. But okay, all that just shows us what we've seen in the last videos. Reversing assembly is really hard, but let's just skip that step. Let's just step through the binary. And in order to do that, I'm gonna run the start command. This is going to run the binary and set a breakpoint at a convenient location in the beginning. But we also see a ton of information on the screen in some bright colors. This is the current context of the binary. Running the context or ctx command will also bring up that information. The first pane that we see here are all of our registers and their values. For example, RDI holds the value OX1, so 1, and RSI holds a pointer pointing to a pointer pointing to slash home slash Kali slash documents and so on slash please crack me, which is the binary that we're currently running. And that's very logical as when starting a program, RDI will hold the amount of arguments that are present and RSI will hold the actual values for those arguments. So we've probably hit a breakpoint in the beginning of our program and the next section, the disassembly section, would agree with us. Here we see the assembly that would be executed next, with the first line being a push RBX at main plus 8, which is in the very beginning of the main function. We also see which assembly will be executed afterwards, and below that, GDB will show us a little bit of the stack. It will also show where RBP and RSP are currently pointing, the stack addresses, and what's in them or where they are pointing towards. You may have already spotted that our binary's path is also present on the stack. Lastly, we also see a backtrace showing how we got into the current function. In this case, there isn't much to see here since, well, the program just started executing, but okay. How do we keep on running through this binary? Well, we can use the next command for that or the shortcut n. If we step through the binary a couple of times, we can see things slightly change. Pro tip, if you just press enter, Pwn Debug will repeat the command that you previously ran, so no need to keep on typing n here. But for example, uh, we're about to execute the printf function, and Pwn Debug shows us some really nice information, such as the format that we're going to use here, which is type in your username, and that's what it's going to be printed out. Now you might be confused why GDB is then saying that another argument to printf is that same string containing a path to the binary. Why does it say that? That's not being printed out. Well, in this case, the format string doesn't contain a format specifier, such as a percentage %s or a percentage %d, thus it's not going to use any other parameters. But printf can have more arguments, and because that string can be found in RSI, which is the register used for the second parameter, Pwn Debug gets confused and shows it here. This is a great example of why it's still very important to have some knowledge of what's going on, even though the tools can help us a lot. But I digress. Let's say I would want to step inside the printf function to see what's going on inside of there. Well, that's possible by typing in step or s. This steps into the function to be called. Sadly, the printf function is quite complex and I would not recommend trying to step through all of this assembly, so I just want to get back out of here and into the main function. To do that, I can use the finish or fin command, which will execute the entire current function and get you back out of there we can see that we just ended up in the main function once again. Let's keep on going through this assembly using n, and after a bit, we can see that we get asked for our username, we can enter it, keep on stepping through the program until we get asked for a number, we can enter that and keep on going. 
And at some point we see string length being called with the string ping draconian, my username. If we keep on continuing, we see it being called again and again, we have reached a loop here. Now we could just keep stepping through every instruction for a long time to get out of here, but that's a very ineffective way of doing things. Let's just go where we actually need to go. Again, we can run this as main to see the assembly and we now also see where we're currently stuck in a loop right here. But what is past that loop? Well, here we see a printf. Um, what is it going to print? Well, right before there, something is being loaded into RDI, but what? Let's find out. For that, we're going to use the examine memory command, which is just an X. This is a command that trips up a lot of people when they're learning GDB because it can look quite difficult in use. But if you pay attention now, then you'll see that it really isn't that difficult to understand. So the X command looks like this. You have X slash format space address. It pretty much says display whatever you can find at this specific address in a certain format. In this case, we want to show what's present at OX5555 and so on. We can show this data in many different kinds of formats. And if we supply a letter to specify the format, for example, an X for hex, a D for decimal, an S for string, a B for byte and so on. And then here's a full list of all of them. But in this case, this is most likely a string. So let's run X slash S and then our address. That shows us the type in the password string. So this printf will print out type in the password. One last thing on the X command is that we can also show the data following our address. For example, if I want to see the 10 strings following that address, I would type in X slash 11 S address. This will be very helpful when you know something ended up near an address, but you're not exactly sure where. Is all of that too difficult for you? Well then, Pwn Debug has the perfect command for you, and that is hex dump. This takes in an address and then the amount of bytes you want to show, and it just shows a hex dump like shown here. This can obviously also come in handy when you don't want to deal with that X command. But okay, back to our assembly. We now know it's going to ask us for a password, which we supply in this scan F. Then it's going to call string compare. And that is very interesting because we just entered in our password. Could this be where the application checks if it's correct? Well, let's find out. And in order to find out, I'm going to set a breakpoint at this function. We can do that using the BP command or the breakpoint command. In this case, the string compare instruction is at main plus 288 or at this address, uh, which is very long. Thus, either using BP main plus 88 or BP and then the address, we can set a breakpoint. Now we can use continue or C to continue the execution of the program. Uh, it asks us for a password, which we knew it was going to do. Uh, let's enter test password as a test. And now it reaches our breakpoint, so it breaks. Immediately, the disassembly pane here should catch your attention because we have indeed stopped at the string compare call and we see that it's comparing our test password with this string. Maybe this is the password. So let's just copy that string and rerun the program using run or R. If we now enter our username, the number five, and then the password we just found, then we see that it's correct. We've logged in. And that is how we have figured out how to find the password without understanding exactly how it was created. We bypassed that whole step and we used Pwn Debug to do that in a dynamic way. And this was just a tip of the iceberg of what GDB has to offer. Next up, we're going to explore some more commands, but this is all a ton to take in and you will not remember all of this immediately. So I'll be going over some great cheat sheets for you to keep close when using GDB. Now that we've seen the basic usage of GDB, let's just cover a couple more things. First of all, there will be cases where you want to pass command line arguments to your program. You can do this in a couple of ways. Um, for example, you can run GDB with dash dash args followed by your program and then your arguments, or you can just set the arguments in GDB itself by running set args followed by your arguments. Need to read what your current arguments are, then you can use the args command for that. Now let's talk about all the ways to go through your program. First of all, run the binary with the run command and with the kill command, you can, well, 
kill the binary, so stop execution. But I prefer to start by using the start command because that will automatically drop me in with a breakpoint somewhere in the start of the program. But what if you hit a breakpoint? Well, then you can step through the program using the step command. But whilst you're doing that, you will quickly notice that you dive into every function. That's very annoying. So use the next command if you want to step through the program without diving into every function. Need to continue until the current function returns, use finish. Need to just continue running the program until it ends or until you hit another breakpoint, use continue. I've just mentioned breakpoints. Let's dig into those. So using break or BP, you can set a breakpoint in a certain location. This location can be a function name followed by a plus and an amount of lines or an offset or an address. To see which breakpoints are currently set, we can use the BL standing for, standing for breakpoint list. We can also disable and enable breakpoints by using BD and BE followed by an index for the breakpoint you want to disable. Now, examining data can be done with the X command, which I've already explained earlier in the video, and I could go into all of that again, as well as a bunch of other stuff that is possible here. But let's be real, you're only going to learn GDB by actually using all of this and we're going to do all of that a couple of videos down the line and then we'll go into more advanced stuff, we'll learn new commands and practice the ones that we've just learned. But in order to help you using GDB, it's also really useful to have some cheat sheets nearby that kind of point you the right way. Therefore, I have two cheat sheets that I'm going to share with you today. The first one is a very old one and it's focused on basic GDB. Um, but it's very good, however, to get the basics down, as you can see here. The second one then is Pwn Debug specific. It's not fully finished, but it does a great job at quickly providing some info. However, always use the help command or the Pwn Debug command in Pwn Debug to see everything that's available. I will put links to these and some more cheat sheets in the description down below. And I highly suggest bookmarking some of them so that you always have a quick and easy way of getting a layout of most of the GDB commands. And that is all for today's video. Today we took a look at GDB. We covered some of its features, mainly the ones we will be using the most. It's impossible to learn and understand all the capabilities of a tool without actually using it. And in this case, we saw a lot of commands that you will need to use to fully grasp. Luckily, we will be using this tool for almost every video in this series in the future, so plenty of time to learn. In the next video, we will be looking at Pwn Tools. A great library that allows us to automate or exploit steps and interact with the binary in a really fine-grained way. This is a must-have in your exploitation toolkit. As I've explained in the beginning of this video, that next video on Pwn Tools will come for sure if we can get a thousand views on this video within the next week. So be sure to share it if you want to reach that goal as I really, really would love to continue this series and get more people into the world of binary exploitation. With all that being said, we've reached the end of the fourth episode of this series. Click the like button if you liked the video and be sure to comment any questions, concerns, or just nice things down below. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you back for the next one. Take care.